go ahead and pull out our sheets and check it out there. Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We'll be where we start. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. And you have this memorized already. But it's a good spot for us to look to. When we're in 2 Timothy 3, Paul's telling Timothy about the things he needs to preach. Because we're about to get to chapter 4 and talk about those people who have itching ears, right? And so as he's going through, he goes there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. He tells them all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not lacking in anything. So as we read that verse, we see that and we see many other passages in the Bible which say something similar. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide even to the point of the bone and marrow, even to the point of soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We see where John, as he is talking about Jesus, talks about the idea of truth. And he says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, why are those passages important to us? Because it's important for us to know that what we believe is correct. Now, there's a lot of religions, people who will knock on your door, and religions across the world, that are what we call better felt than told. And what they mean by that is the way they know that they're true and the way they know they're accurate is just this feeling you get in the pit of your stomach or this warm feeling that you get in your chest and you just know that these things are going to be right. I remember many years ago sitting around a table, some people had knocked on the door and I'd let them in and we had talked back and forth, you know. They had a certain kind of Bible they wanted me to read and we were going back and forth talking about Bibles and everything else. And they said, well, Mr. Ray... They said, just tonight, pray. Pray for God to show you the truth and then pray for him to do something in your life. And then if you see something change, then you'll know that we're preaching to you the truth. I said, all right. And I prayed for one of those brand new trucks with really big tires and it didn't happen. But they were wanting me to just kind of say, well, okay, I feel that that's right. Now, sometimes as Christians, we run into that. We want to have a feeling that something's right. And sometimes we're afraid of attacks which people have against Christianity, and we don't want to look into the reliability of the religious texts which have been given to us. And so sometimes we're worried about that. One thing we have to realize is this book is the most documented book that's ever been created. And your faith rests on what's in this book. And so you have to know without a doubt the veracity of what's in here. A lot of people say, well, the Bible can't be trusted. And this quarter, as you know, we've gone through this section looking at misconceptions about Christianity. And we see where some people say, listen, you know, the Bible's not true. It's just a bunch of cleverly devised tales which you may follow. And as you and I read there in 2 Peter chapter 1... Peter says, no, that's not the case at all. Peter says, I'm an eyewitness of the majesty of the Lord. And what he's doing is going back there to Matthew 17, talking about the man, Mount of Transfiguration. Remember how 1 John 1 opens up? I love the way John opens up that letter. He says, that which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have listened to, that which we have beheld. He goes through all these things <coughs> and he says, that is that which we preach to you. In other words, he says, listen, I have touched Jesus. I have held Jesus. I have watched him as he goes through the day. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And so it's important for us to know that the Bible's true. So let's go ahead and talk about some things about the Bible. Of course, our Bibles are not just one book, but how many books are there in the Bible? You remember that from way back when? 66, right? There you go, 66 books in the Bible. And you'll find about two-thirds of this is what's called the Old Testament, right? One-third of it is about the New Testament. Old Testament's 39 books. New Testament's 27 books. How many people wrote the Bible? You remember that? Usually we say about 40. 
some of it depends on who you say wrote the book of Hebrews. You got 40 men who wrote the Bible. Now, let's talk real quick about cultures that these guys were from. What nation did each of these guys live in? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John lived under what empire? Roman Empire, right? Okay, same with most of the New Testament written in Rome. Okay, Moses, he grew up his first 40 years in what empire? Egypt, right? Okay, David, he was in Israel, right? Okay, and then you have uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah. They're also Israel, but later, pre-exilic. You have the minor prophets, which would be post-exilic. You have Daniel, who, what empire was he under? Two, actually, right? The Babylonians and the Persians. What empire was Nehemiah under? The Persian Empire. Okay, you go through, you find 11 different governments or cultures, at least, that the Bible is written in. Now, why does this matter? How different are people on the other sides of the world? Ed, when you go to, or go to uh, Africa, how different are those guys? What's their favorite food? Favorite, what? favorite food over in Africa? Oh, hot pepper, I think. Hot pepper, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everything's got a hot flavor yeah, to it. Yeah. yeah. They eat a lot of rice. A lot of rice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Their food different than here? Oh, yeah. Okay. They didn't have a Los Portales, did they? No. No, not too much. Okay. Who's been to different countries besides that? Okay, Italy and Germany. How are they different? They're pretty. They're pretty. <laughs> okay. Germany takes every meat and throws gravy over it. Every meat in Germany gets gravy on it somehow. Okay. Gerald, where have you been? Canada. Okay, Canada. All right. Now, all I know about Canada is they play hockey and they put A at the end of every sentence, right? And they're really proud, or they're really nice and polite. All right. You look all around the world, people have very different views about food, very different views about God, very different views about everything. And what's really neat about the Bible is you've got 40 men from 11 cultures, and look what they agree on. Every one of them believe in God, not just a God, but the God who's three in one, the triune God, which is a very complex concept. Every one of them see God in his holiness, his justice, but also in his love, which is a very interesting balance which is there. Every one of them conform to everybody else as far as there not being mistakes or there not being different views of heaven, of hell, of salvation, of all these things. Now, is that a big deal? Is it easy to get 40 people to agree on everything? No, it's not, is it? Sometimes it's hard to get two or three people to agree on something, right? You know, where you want to eat? I don't know. It's, you know, go through that. And so one of the proofs of the Bible that show that it's true is just the way it's put together. Because you have apocalyptic literature. Now, what's apocalyptic mean? It's a Latin term which means hidden. Okay, What books in the Bible seem to be hidden or have hidden meaning sometimes? Book of Revelation, right? The last part of the book of Daniel, Zephaniah, Ezekiel. Okay, you got a lot of apocalyptic there. You got poetry. You see Psalm and Job. And you see the poetry which is there, even Proverbs. You see a narrative, right? The book of Acts, Joshua, uh, much of the book of Deuteronomy. Or numbers. Uh, you see uh, law as it comes through the book of Leviticus. And you see all these different types of literature. You see all these different writers. You see all these different cultures. How many languages was the Bible written in? The New Testament was written in King James. No, not King James. What was it written in? Greek, right? Old Testament was written in Hebrew, okay? And you have small parts of the Old Testament written in Aramaic. So you have three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. So you go through all these languages, all these cultures, all this time which was covered, all these things together, and yet you have one unified book 
which teaches all these amazing concepts in unity. And that is a wonderful aspect of showing the Word of God and the way in which it works in all these things. Now, look at our second point here. In cultures that considered some people such as Pharaoh to be deities and other people as property, the Bible writers offer the same understanding of human nature. You go through in Egyptian times, people were just property, just like a cow or whatever else that the Pharaoh would use for his purpose. And then you go also looking at Pharaoh and Pharaoh's son, they view themselves as God. And so you see all those different views which people had of people going through the whole time. Every time when the Bible talks about these folks, you see that people are created in the image of whom? Genesis 127. You're made with the breath of God. Now, what does that mean? I used to think, okay, that meant that God had two eyes and a nose, you know, he looked just like me, maybe walking around up there, probably a little prettier. What does it mean that you're created in the image of God? Huh? Okay, you have a soul, all right? You're different than your puppy dog, although we love our puppy dogs. We are different than our puppy dog. I don't love my puppy dog as much as I used to. This has been a rough week in the puppy dog. I came home, I think it was Thursday night. Walked in the house and I thought, oh, what in the world happened? My dog got sprayed by a skunk. And um, the dog hates to be bathed, okay? This is how bad it was. I opened the door. The dog ran into the bathroom and got in the bathtub and looked at me. I was like, all right, we're going to scrub you down. But, oh, yeah, I don't know if we love each other as much as we used to with that smell. Man. Well, People are different than animals. People are different than cows. You're not just a piece of property. You're made in the image of God. You have that God spark. If you look at C.S. Lewis and look at how he puts it, you have a God, God spark that's within you. And every single person has that image. No matter how bad you may be, you have that spark that's within you. So you are special, you are good, you are wonderful. As a little kid wrote in that story in the old Bible class, you've heard that lesson. Everybody didn't like him, but he still wrote a little thing to put on the wall of his Bible class. And it said, God don't make no junk. Talking about himself and how special he was. God don't make no junk. But juxtaposed to being made in the image of God, we see that Adam and Eve did what in the garden? They partook of the forbidden fruit, right? And we see that each one of us today, when we reach the age of accountability, what do we tend to do? We sin, don't we? And while mankind is inherently good, we see in Ezekiel 18, 20, that only the soul who sins shall die. We do not have original sin, as some people in Calvinism teach. We see that we are susceptible to messing up and we wrestle with that because we want to be good and we want to do what's right and we we each day grow closer to God and we become better but we also see that we are weak and frail beings and so it's interesting when you go through the Bible you see that wonderful uh, balance which is there you see where God continually redeems his people even when they're not doing well because they're special. But you see, even when people think that they're special, oftentimes they get punished because of their sins. And it's something we have to work with and think through our lives quite a bit as we go through that. Something I find really interesting as we look at. All right, looking on the back side of our paper. What's neat about it is it offers a common understanding of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Jesus is man, and that is hard to explain. Was he half God, half man, 50-50? No. He was all God, and he was all man. I, I got in trouble one time on a, a mission trip when I was in college uh, in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. We were up there door knocking, and I got to preach one night. 
and I think I misspoke something. And one of the teachers there at Fried Hardman pulled me aside and said, no, you got to make this a little clearer. And so we talked about it. And at the end of it, I was clear as mud. Um, what I had talked about was uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And, you know, your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, who being in a very nature God, did not consider godliness or his godlikeness something to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself and gave himself up. You remember that passage? And it goes on talking about how he died on the cross. And I talked about in that passage about how Jesus left heaven and left being God to come here and dwell upon earth. And the teacher said, boy, that's Gnosticism. He cannot leave being God. And I understood that, but what I was meaning to say, you ever say something and it doesn't come out right? Just try being a preacher. Whew, all right. Um, what I meant to say was he left heaven where all, all the angels were constantly adoring and worshiping him, where he was never hungry, where he was never thirsty, where he never hurt, he was never rejected. He had left all of that to live like you and I, to live like a common person. And that part's true. But he's still God, and he's still man. And so you have both together, and that's hard to fathom. But you run through the Bible, and through all those cultures and all those languages, everybody agrees that's what's happening. You go through the end of the book of Daniel, and you see the Son of Man coming, and you see that in Ezekiel as well. It's a perfect description of Jesus. You see Joshua as he looks up, and he sees the angel of the Lord you see a perfect description of Jesus. And you go through John, and you go through Luke, and you go through Revelation, and you see even in the end of Revelation, or the beginning of Revelation, where those eyes are going back like flaming fire, and you, you know, he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, who is to come. He's Lord God Almighty. It's interesting to see those aspects of Jesus as you go through. And so he's both God and man. He became a real human. He learned how to bleed, how to sweat, how to cry. To show the world the God that it could not otherwise perceive. He even died on the cross for each one of us. You ever wonder why God picked the way that he picked? If God is so powerful, why couldn't he just look at us, snap his fingers, which would be really easy, and just say, listen, all of y'all are saved. And he would say that, by the way, because he'd just be Southern, right? All y'all are saved. He wouldn't say all you guys. Why didn't Jesus just snap his fingers and say, okay, you're saved, instead of letting his son die for us? What'd you got, man? Okay. Yeah, the free will. Free will, yeah. Uh, like the illustration we always saw, use in here, oftentimes. Uh, I got an apple tree out of, over that house over there, okay? That apple tree is not debating with itself right now man, am I going to put out a pecan this year? Or maybe a watermelon, right? Now, it's probably going to bloom. It's probably going to snow 10 feet, and I probably won't get apples. That's just the way it seems it's going to work this year. It's February, and I'm thinking I'm about to need to mow, which is scaring me to death. But an apple tree has to produce apples, right? A cow out here is going to produce more cattle, right? But you and I, we're the only thing upon this earth that gets to make a choice, which makes us higher than all the animals. That's a good point. It's a good point. To give us a choice, and that's what the gospel does. That's why Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 talks about how it's a better covenant. The Jews were Jews because of birth, their connection to Abraham. We are spiritual Jews because of our spiritual birth, which we've made by choice. Okay? But why couldn't God just say, listen, anybody who wants to be saved... You're saved. Why did he have to murder his son, torture his son? It's because of God's inherent nature. God is a just God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. Remember last Sunday night we spent some time talking about righteousness. It's a legal term of innocence. And he cannot overlook sin, otherwise he's not God. He is not his character. And so something had to be shed for our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no life. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. 
And so a perfect lamb of God had to be sacrificed so that you and I could be made whole and you and I can be made free. And that's something that's really important there for us to recognize. But every one of these Bible writers understood that fully and had that point down. Lastly, they all offer the same hope. God will accomplish his, person, his purpose for his creation. There is hope, and God is working through us to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. Now, I may show my age here because my kids didn't get to do this. When you were in grade school, did you get one of those writing pads that had a line here, a line there, and a dotted line? I think it was the Big Red Chief Indian. You remember that? Are y'all as old as me? Okay. And you remember, this is way back, back when they used to teach cursive in school. Y'all remember that? Way back when, cursive. Well, you remember the teacher would have all those letters across the top, or she would write something, and what you had to do was you had to try to trace it out with that dotted line and that top line and try to get your penmanship to be exactly what your teacher's penmanship was. Right? Yes, I made a C in penmanship, which started my entire academic career. Okay? I never have been able to write well at all. And so... There you go, going through that. Now, the reason I bring that out is that idea of copying there in a perfect way, that is the background of that word workmanship. So you read there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, remember the context. Ephesians 2, starting in verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, is not of yourselves, as a gift of God, you know, that no one should be lost, that no one should boast by their own works. Remember that? You remember verse 14, he is made, I love the way the King James says it because of Southern, he is made to twain to become one. Or as we would say in our newer translations, he is made to two to become one in him. Now, how does God get from us being saved from our sins through grace to this idea that we're all unified in the Lord's church? You see there in verse 10. What I do as a Christian is I see Jesus' perfect example and I trace it out in my life. And let me tell you, sometimes I make a C. <laughs> I don't do as well as I want to. But that's what that background of that word means there. And so there's hope. There is hope in your life because that's what God's wanting you to do is practice copying who he is and what he is and how it is we are to live. And so that's the first thing we notice when we say, okay, is Christianity reasonable? Can the Bible be trusted? Look at it as a unit. Notice 11 different cultures. Notice three different languages. Notice 40 different men. Notice it's over 1,600 years, and it all agrees. It all unites as one. Now, going apart from the internal evidence, we continue here. We see the external evidence, which is there. And you'll see a few references here, and we've talked about some others as well. You got Pliny. You got uh, Tracidus. You got Josephus. You've got all these folks. Now, Pliny, the elder, are the guy, that's the guys whose writings we have today. The younger uh, was trying to save people at uh, Vesuvius, Pompeii, and he ended up dying on the beach. But Pliny, the elder, he wrote quite a bit, and he uh, was a historian who wrote about what was happening in his day. And at least three times we see references to Jesus. We see references, or as he calls them, Christos. And we see references to Christianity and the effect of the church. We also see in Tacitus that churches existed in that day. And also that there was a fellow named Jesus. He calls him Jesse. That lived in the uh, area of Judea who started his own church or started his own religion. Josephus as well talks about him. Now why does that matter to us? Because you'll find people who don't believe in God who say Jesus is a myth never existed. All these things are made up. Somebody just made up a book or whatever else it may be. Well, even if you totally, totally take out what's here and say, I'm not even going to listen to the Bible, look at the Bible, care about the Bible at all. Even if you throw all that out, you can look at historical writers and you see that about the time of 0 to 50 AD, there was a guy named Jesus who lived in Judea. You see that he was a great teacher 
and he called many people to follow after him. You see that he was executed by a man named Pilate, and in his execution, many people were upset about it, and that many people claim in that day that he had been risen from the dead. You see that many people followed him, and then you see that in just a few hundred years, the entire empire converted to follow him, and the entire empire was changed. And so you take Christianity out of it, you still see that Christian, or take the Bible out of Christianity as far as a proof, you still see that Christianity exists. It is an historical religion, a verifiable religion. And once again, we talked about this two weeks ago, it's what I call the ring rule. You go out to a pond and you throw a rock, what's going to happen? Bloop, right? Rock goes down, but you have evidence that rock was thrown by what? The ripples, the rings going out. And so what we have here is the rock, okay? But you pull out the rock, you have the ripples. You have evidence that what is written in this book is true and that what is written in this book is verifiable and that you and I can trust in him, trust in God. Now, going beyond that, we see the evidence of archaeology. And you head out there through the Middle East, and you head out there through Greece and Asia Minor, which is today Turkey, and you can dig around and stuff. A lot of times people don't exactly appreciate it because they built on top of it. And it's interesting, when they do a dig out there, oftentimes they'll have to dig 20 feet under somebody's house in order to get back to Bible days. But what's interesting in archaeology is how much it proves that the Bible is true. We see, especially going through the book of Acts, that these people who are in charge of the different places in the cities, very true people. We see that the places where they go are all very true. I think I have written here in this paragraph, I should have, a guy named William Ramsey. Do I have him? Where is he at? Where am I? Do you ever ask yourself that? <laughs> Yeah, Sir William Ramsey, 18th century. It's in this paragraph right here. He was a, um, obviously a nobleman over from England who was an avowed atheist, and he decided to make it his life's work to disprove Christianity. And so what he decided to do was he went over to that area. Much of that area was an English colony at the time, and he began going by boat to try to retrace Paul's uh, missionary journey. And as he traveled, he ended up converting himself out of an atheistic viewpoint into a Christian viewpoint. And the reason he did that was because he recognized that Luke had to be there at that day in order to write that. Somebody who was somewhere else could not know the information that Luke uses. Luke is very precise in his information. And We'll have that commentary if you want to read it. It'll be in our church library. It's one of the classic commentaries which is out there. It's a little bit dated nowadays, but we still have that commentary. But it's interesting when you go through it, the closer and closer <coughs> excuse me, you look at this book, the more and more you realize the things which are written are true. The things which are written here are verified so that we can know that the Bible is correct. And we can know that we can follow him through everything that we do. Okay? Let's read this last paragraph, then we will talk a little bit more. The more one examines the evidence, the more one becomes convinced that the Bible is more than just a cleverly devised tale. It has a ring of authenticity. But in that case, readers ought to pay attention to its message. Notice what Mark Twain says. It's the ultimate issue. Mark Twain aptly put it, it's not the things in the Bible that people can't understand that are troublesome, but it's the things that they can understand. Even if people are convinced that the Bible is true from cover to cover, will they heed its message? All right. Let's talk about Mark Twain for a little bit. Samuel Clemens. Interestingly, not a Christian. But anyway, we'll go beyond that. Notice what he said. He said, the problem in the Bible isn't the parts that I can't understand. And a lot of times that's where we focus in it. We go to the book of Revelation and we're like, okay, how in the world does this little critter have 10 heads and 12 horns? What in the world's going on here? And we misunderstand it's apocalyptic, symbolic literature. That's not where you need to be spending all your time, right? 
Because a lot of times, you and I, we need to be focusing a little bit more on the Sermon on the Mount. Or we need to be focusing a little bit more on those sermons and acts, right? The problem with the Bible, and one of the reasons why people don't want to follow this, and people want to say it's not true, is because the implications it would have in their life. We have an obligation to follow after God. What are some things that people don't want to follow in the Bible nowadays, you think? Okay, coming to church. All right. The idea of sacrifice. I, I mentioned this at the end of class last week. Real quickly, and then the bell rang. Time does that to you. It just catches you. I think every sin in the Bible goes back to selfishness. A lot of people will look over in 1 Timothy 6, right, and say, you know, money is the root of all evil. I think in many ways it goes back to selfishness. Why did Eve partake of that fruit? It looked good, but it also would make her as smart as God and equal to God. And she really was attracted to that, and people today are really attracted to that. But you go to about every sin, sometimes it doesn't. There are some times there's a sin of passion as far as murder or something like that. But primarily it goes back to selfishness. We want to please self instead of pleasing God. But as a Christian, what does our attitude need to be? Serving. What did John the Baptizer say when his disciples were upset that Jesus was getting more disciples? He said, he must become greater and I must become less. That needs to be the goal of every one of us. To be more like God, to make him greater and us lesser, if you will. Yes, sir, Gerald. Yeah. Uh huh. You tell them not to do something, they can't do it. That's going to stay in their mind, and they're going to keep thinking, "Well, why can't you?" Yeah. I won't do that. Right. You know, and, and you tell them no, but they just keep saying, "I won't do that." Are you Where saying you're stubborn that way? Alone, you know? Yeah. Sometimes that's the uh, easiest way to get somebody to do something is tell them they can't do it. Right. Right. Uh, right now, everybody, do not think about pink elephants. All right? Did anybody think about pink elephants? All right. Yeah, that's one of those things. You know, and, and that's true. And sometimes there's a lot of selfishness, which is there. When you tell somebody not to do something, the very first thing they want to do, and it's hard to humble ourselves and obey. That's very true. That's very true. Okay, any other comments? Any other things that you say when you talk to somebody about? Yes, ma'am, Marilyn. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we went to a movie Thursday night. Is Genesis History. And uh, it was a good movie. A lot of science there. I was joking with Matthew on the way home. What I told him was, anytime I watch a movie of two hours, something needs to blow up. <laughs> Nothing blew up. It was scientists, you know, explaining a lot of different things. They covered three main aspects in the movie. The very first part was the historical aspect of proving that the flood occurred and proving that the world was created in six days. The next thing they looked at was the idea of astronomy, the solar system and the galaxy, and how each part of the galaxy proves the existence of God and proves that the way in which Genesis is written is a very literal way of looking at it. And then the third part was looking at it from a molecular aspect and seeing that Genesis was correct in that way as well as far as the creation. And, uh, and archaeology. I think there was an archaeology aspect to it as well. So it was really neat seeing all that put together. And we had, I think, 28 from here who went. That's what I counted as I was there. Because that's what preachers do. We count. How many people are here? So, all right. It will be. It will be. Uh, their goal was to try to get it into movie theaters, to try to get encourage them to release, and I think it's going to be released again Thursday. It'll be out again Thursday night, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, hmm? yeah, it's in Paducah. It'll be out again Thursday night, but it will eventually be on DVD. It will come out in that way. 
probably just a few weeks, I would guess, that it'll come out in that way. I don't, do they make DVDs anymore? I guess they do. We are like right at the very end of that technology, which is just weird. Okay. All right. Anything else to say? All right. I'm going to let you out early. But you remember what the rule is when I let you out early, right? <laughs> Nobody run in the halls. Okay. No yelling or throwing things. And don't make your children come and get you. All right. Thanks for being here. I think it'll be out there.